continue with the last two chapters. I posted the f first two that we read yesterday. Tomorrow is so Easter. So we will be posting this on Easter. So the last two chapters will go together on Easter. Tomorrow is Easter. I'm so excited. All right. Easter Torn in two, Amon started back up the shaft. I can't do it, he cried to himself. I can't do it. He'd overcome many things, but his fear of rats was so great that he could not tame it, even to save his father. I am not really a man, he thought. A man would be strong enough to go on, even though he's afraid. Amon climbed toward the top of the shaft. He cried at his own weakness, but then he stopped. He hung his head in shame and fear. It is not my courage that is weak, he decided. It is my faith. And with that, he prayed aloud. Jehovah, help me, he whispered into the dark. And from somewhere, Amon felt a bit of extra courage flow into his body. Taking a deep breath, Amon slowly began climbing back down the shaft. Every time his foot would touch a rat, or he'd hear one squeak in his ear, a monk would retreat to repeat the prayer. And each time a bit of supernatural courage would fill his heart and soul. A short time later, Amon reached the level of the cells and found his, the side tunnel. And that's when he realized the pools far below were not for collecting rainwater, as were those under the temple. The, these were for collecting sewage. Amon ga gagged at the stench and recoiled at the sight of the rats filled, filling the tunnel. But he was almost there and wasn't about to give up now. He maneuvered into the tunnel, bent low at the waist so as not to hit his head on the ceiling and forced himself to wade forward through the ankle-deep sludge. Rats were all around, but by now he barely even noticed them. All he cared about was getting his father and getting out. Light shone through the first drain hole and he came up, came upon, and Amon's heart started to pound. In moments he could see his father and rescue him from death. Amon had to bend even lower, his hair almost dripping into, dipping into the sewage in order to see into the cell on the other side. It was empty. Amon could see the torch-lit passage on the other side, the passageway he himself had walked just a few days before. By moving back and forth, he could see from the corner to corner of the cell, and he spotted an unused blanket, but he, the cell was empty. That's one, he thought, and then moved on to the next. The second cell was also empty, and the third and the fourth, empty, empty, yeah. empty. Amon reached the last cell, and it was empty. He leaned against the wall and silently screamed out his pain and frustration. Great sobs rose within, sobs he had to muffle and stifle and fight. His father was gone. After all his investigations and planning and of climbing through the sewage, his father was dead. Amon sobbed bitterly. His father wasn't in the cells where he thought he should be. Amon sobbed bitterly for several minutes, but even numb with grief, his mind knew he must escape from this horrible place and go home to be a father to his younger brothers. Just as he turned to head back the way he had come, Amon felt a sharp stab in his shin. He looked down and screamed. He knocked the rat away just as it was taking a second bite out of his leg, but swung too hard and plunged the torch into the muck on the tunnel floor. The sewer tunnel was black. Unable to see now and knowing he never get the torch relit, a mom pushed his way forward in the dark, swinging the dead torch like a club to knock away any rats in his path. He reached the vertical shaft and started climbing, knocking rats off the ledge as he needed for his fingers and toes. He felt his way along until he reached the top of the shaft and climbed through the hole into the upper tunnel. I've never find my way in the dark, he thought. Moments later, the ground started to shake. Amon screamed. In the blackness in the tunnel, he could see nothing, and they're thrown from side to side as the earthquake grew. He felt the bricks beneath his feet ripple and waves like water and felt the ceiling overhead dip and knock him on his head. Grainy gaining power by the second, the earthquake grew through Amon to the ground, and then he heard the bricks of the walls and the ceiling collapse behind him, the direction he needed to go to escape. Amon's head slammed against the rough bricks of the tunnel wall, and for a moment he saw the light of stars. Pain sliced through his skull as he jabbed by a knife, and he felt blood running down his cheek. A thunder cracked, a thunderous crack. 
Amon's ears were boxed with a slap of air pressure. The ceiling on the other side of him collapsed with a roar of thunder. Then suddenly, it was still and quiet. Amon breathed hard and choked on the dust, almost refusing to believe he would survive such a thing. Light! Light streamed down through the dust from a new hole in the ceiling. It was daylight. As the dust began to settle, Amon saw that the tunnel through which he had originally come was completely blocked with rubble. But there was now a new escape, a hole in the ceiling. Climbing carefully over the jagged debris, Amon ascended toward the light. Dust filled his lungs and he coughed continually as he climbed out the hole. Finally, he broke through the, and collapsed in a, on the smooth, cool surface of the polished marble floor. He lay there for several minutes, catching his breath, and sat up and looked around. Amon gasped. He was sitting in the middle of the temple itself. Inside the holy place, with its altar and the incense and a table of shrewbread, shrew, showbread. And there, at the other end of, of the holy place, was the holy of holies, the place where God dwells on earth, the place no man can see without dying. He started for a long moment, wondering why he wasn't dead already, and then stared at the thick veil that was supposed to be separating the holy of holies from the holy place, just so that men wouldn't accidentally look over the face of God and die. The veil was ripped in two. Oh, that's what's called turned into. Remember what happened when Jesus died yeah. on the cross? Yeah. There was an earthquake and the oh, yeah. veil in the temple ripped Was in ripped two. from oh. top to bottom. So oh, the red curtain. The veil. This is the red veil? Okay. It hung loosely on either side of the Holy of Holies, revealing the place where God lives. Why aren't I dead? Among wondered again. And then he quickly turned away, shielding his eyes so as not to look at anything he shouldn't see. Amon stood and headed straight for the tall double doors that would take him out of this dangerously sacred place. But just as he started to push on them, the door suddenly opened on their own. Standing on the other side was a mob half the size of Jerusalem, led by Caiaphas, and the rest of the priest. As one of the crowd slammed to the stop, staring at the devil emerging from the temple. Co covered from head to toe with dust and grime and sludge, Amon looked like a creature from the under, under the earth. As everyone stared at him, Amon squinted hard against the bright sunlight, his mouth hanging open. Caiaphas looked past Amon into the temple. He threw his hands up in front of his face to shield himself from the sight and yelled, What have you done? Then he turned to the four guards who had opened the doors and demanded, Seize him! Two guards grabbed him on by the arms, while the other two hastily slammed the door, shut the doors to the temple. People had screamed when they saw the inside of the temple, and many now began weeping and tearing their clothes for the destruction they had witnessed. Amon was dragged out through the crowd, and many spat on him, cursing him and calling him foul names. Then, just as he was being hauled through the court of women, Amon heard his name. Amon! came the voice again. And he searched for and then found its source. Tamar was jumping up behind some people, waving to, great, to get his attention. She was crying. Amon! Tamar shouted again. And it sounded like a cart crashing into a wall. They killed him, she wailed. And Amon, in shock, stopped fighting against the guards. They crucified him, Tamar called, collapsing in tears. No, Amon screamed. Sobbing, Amon's body went limp as the guards hauled him away to prison. The guards threw water on Amon to clean him up, more so they wouldn't have to smell him than out of any sense of kindness. Amon didn't care. He was chained to the ceiling of a prison cell in the basement of the palace of Caiaphas, strung up under an archway by his arms, charged with the des desecration of the temple. Others had been chained here, he could see, and were re re and very recently. Fresh blood covered the pavement at his feet. On the wall hung a, a whip with many tails, bits of metal, and sharp tone, stone woven into its leather. Amon wondered without passion how the whip would feel, whipping would feel. Though his body throbbed with pain and his tongue was thick with thirst, Amon felt nothing. He is dead, Tamara screamed. They crucified him. Then as the guards were dragging him out of the court of women, Benjamin was running beside him, sobbing. They killed Jesus, he cried, and two thieves with him, and two thieves with him. 
Images of the, of the empty cells Amon had seen have flashed through his mind, images that would be bur burned there for all time. But it was the muttering comment of one of the guards that crushed Amon's heart completely. One of those thieves was a good man, the guard had said. Uh, other images Amon visualized on his own. Images of three men on crosses dying, one of him, them his father, and the other a false messiah. Sorry. A truth messiah. Jesus wasn't the messiah after all. That realization had hit Amon almost as hard as the news of the death of his father. His father's fate had always been as possibility and was somewhat prepared for it. That Jesus had died a failure and an imposter was a shock. I really believed in him, Amon sobbed. I was really convinced he was the one. What a fool I am. And those were the thoughts that had kept him company through the long cold night. But they did not go away with the warmth of day and now the next morning. Amon knew they would stay with him the rest of his life, however short that might be. His arms had gone numb by now, the bolts of pain in the shoulders turned only when he tried to move. Footsteps echoed up the corridor outside, and Amon looked up, shot across the small window in the wooded door of his cell, and then came back and stopped. He heard the scraping of a key in the lock and a gulp it, and gulped. Now the whipping would start, and Amon doubted he'd, he'd be alive at the end of it. No matter, he thought. I will not face my face as a child. I will face it like a man. Pulled his head up straight, threw his shoulders back as best he could, hanging as he was, and glared at the door as it swung open. Two huge temple guards entered, both with arms as thick as trees. This would be a per particularly savage beating, Amon realized. Behind the two guards was an officer, and Amon realized with a start that it was Rafu, the captain he had interrogated. A fourth man entered, this one wearing white robes. Shadows covered the man's face, men's faces for several moments, but when he moved into the light, Amon saw that it was Nari, scribe to Caiaphas. The cell was becoming excuse me, crowded by now, but still two more figures entered through the doorway. Gamaliel, Amel rasped, and behind him was Joseph of Armathia. Armathia. Amon's teacher looked distressed. Get him down from there, he barked. Rafu nodded to two guards, who released Amon's wrists from their shackles. Amon collapsed to the ground, unable to stand or even hold himself up. Gamaliel, Joseph, Nari, and Rafu all rushed to his side. Water, Rafu commanded, and the guards handed him a skin. Gamaliel grabbed the water for Rafu and slowly dipped it into Amon's mouth. Amon lapped up the water desperately. Slowly now, Gamaliel said. Allow your body to recover at its own pace. Soon Amon felt his strength returning and he sat up on his own. What, what happened? he asked. The four adults looked at each other, then Nari spoke. Caiaphas has already ordered you beaten to death, the scribe said. I reminded him that Pilate forbade him from executing anyone, but he just screamed that he cared not what Pilate thought. He was going to see you dead for desecrating the temple. After all that's happened, Nari concluded, he wanted to see someone pay for it. What's happened? Amon asked again. Joseph leaned in and spoke for the first time. The city is in chaos, he said. The moment Jesus died, the skies grew dark and the earthquake started. It seemed to last an eternity, he whispered, closing his eyes. People are even reporting that graves were opened, Gamiel added, and that the dead were resurrected. Amon stared at his two most... Amon stared at his two mentors, trying to understand. Everyone has seen the temple swaying, Joseph continued with the story, and ran to see if it was damaged. That's when you came out of the doors, and we could see that the veil was torn in two. Amon now remembered his experience and asked, Why am I not dead? I saw the Holy of Holies. As we all did, Gamiel said, shaking his head, I do not know why the figure of God finger of God spared us. Amon nodded, thinking then, and he asked, What if my father? Joseph shook his head. After the executions, I went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus to bury it in my own tomb. But the Romans had already taken down the bodies of the others and thrown them in a common grave. For the first time since entering the tunnels the day before, Amon acted like a child again. He burrowed his head in Gamaliel's chest and cried for his father. Come now, Rufu said a few minutes later. We must go before Caiaphas changes his mind. Gamaliel 
and Joseph supported Ammon between them and headed out of the prison. On the way, Ammon recovered enough to ask, How is it I am being freed? Joseph and Gamaliel looked at each other, but it was Nari who answered, Your two friends here challenged Caiaphas in front of the entire Sanhedrin. Ammon looked in shock at his two mentors, who simply shrugged. Caiaphas was in the middle of the sentencing you to death, Nari continued, blaming you for the torn veil. When Gamaliel stood up and roared, You would just satisfy your anger with the blood of a boy. Of the word boy, Amon looked sharply at his teacher. Gamaliel shrugged and said, Sometimes you must use the words which will persuade, Amon nodded. Then Joseph stood, Nari said, added, and said, If you kill this boy, Caiaphas, I will demand a closer investigation into the thief of which his father, theft of which his father is accused. That brought the whole Sanhedrin into an uproar, and soon your release was ordered. Amon looked first at Gamiel, and then at Joseph, and said, My family will be in your debt for three generations. He tried to bow, but in his weakness he only stumbled. By now they had reached the door to the prison, and Rifu opened it with a large key. Sunlight knocked Amon backward, but his two friends held him steady. Rafu and Iri started, stayed behind, while Gam. Malil and Joseph walked Amon through the streets of Jerusalem to his home. They stopped at a pool on the way to bathe and stench the stench off of Amon. The disciples of Jesus have all disappeared, Gamiel, Gamiel said to Amon, washing his hair. They fear retribution from Caiaphas, as well they should. Judas, Amon said, suddenly remembered, Judas betrayed Jesus. I was there and saw it with my own eyes. Gamaliel nodded. Yes, it is so, he said. After Jesus was crucified, Judas was overcome with guilt. So he threw his blood money to, at the priest in the temple and then went out and hung himself, hanged himself. Which means he, he killed, killed himself. himself. Amon thought about this as his two mentors dressed him in a new tunic and led him up the street. He was weary of all the death and destruction, deceptions. But his heart soared when he heard, turned the corner and saw his house. When they walked through the door, Tabitha screamed and rushed to her son. I thought I had lost you too, Tabitha cried as, she, as they hugged. She thanked the two men, then Amon followed them outside. Joseph left and Gamaliel turned to go, but Amon stopped him. I, I cannot think of a proper word for which to thank you, he said. You saved my life. Gamaliel shook his head violently. No, he said, I am a coward. I stood back and watched these last weeks as Caiaphas used his office for shame and treachery. But you, he said, taking Amon's chin in his hand, you fought like a man, with the courage of a warrior. You didn't give up and put your own life in jeopardy for the ones you loved and things you believed in. Amon, Gamaliel said quietly, in this matter, you have been my mentor. Amon stared at his teacher for a moment, then bowed in acceptance of the compliment. Back inside the house, Amon, his mother, and his two brothers spent most of the afternoon mourning the death of their father and husband. I trust in Jehovah, Tabitha kept saying. He will care for us no matter what. After a time, Tabitha told Amon that he should go upstairs. He did as mother suggested and found their five of Jesus' disciples, including Bartholomew, who had, who had Tamar with him. The disciples were sitting on the floor in the shadows around the edges of the room. They had the windows covered, and every one of them looked half dead. Amon and Tamar greeted in dark whispers when then he asked her what was going on. They fear for their lives, she said. Now that Jesus is gone, they think the temple guards will be after them next. And, she added, they are devastated that Tamar couldn't finish her sentence, as Amon did it for her, that Jesus was a false prophet. Tamar hung her head but did not, didn't say anything. Amon looked around the room at the disciples. It is understandable, he said. The men are very con the man was very convincing. He even fooled me for a time. Amon waited for several moments, but Tamar didn't say anything, so he turned to go. He could still be the Messiah, Tamar said softly. Amon spun around, surprised by her, her words. What did you say? I said, maybe Jesus really is the Messiah. Amon looked at his friend as if she was claiming to be the Messiah herself. How can you say such a thing, he hissed, not wanting to raise his voice in the den of sorrow. I just think, when I think of everything I heard him say and everything I saw him do, 
I just think that maybe tomorrow I'm on whisper becoming almost angry now. Jesus is dead. He couldn't save my father. He couldn't even save himself. How could he be the savior of the world? Tamara turned to her father for help, but Bartholomew turned away, his ho hollow eyes showing no emotion. Believe what you want, Amon said finally with a shake of his head, but Jesus is dead, and he's not coming back to life. Please go. Tamara opened her mouth as if to speak, but Amon turned and began climbing the ladder to the roof, wanting to see his bed and all his belongings neatly in order. Everything in its place, as if life hadn't been in chaos. At that moment, there was a loud pounding on the door below. The disciples jumped up in panic, each pulled further back into the shadows if they could hide from the temple guards. <clears throat> Amon raced down the stairs in time to see his mother open the front door, filling the doorway with two Roman centurions so large that they blocked the sunset behind them. Is this the house of Amon, son of Jotham? One of them demanded. Tabat and Tabitha nodded her head. Then may we enter, the Roman continued more softly. I need the help of a friend. The two centurions stepped inside and then Amon recognized Cornelius. You are most welcome indeed, my friend, he said, jumping down the last few steps. But then he recognized the second Roman and skidded to stop staring. It was the centurion who had taunted him at the fortress the night he visited Cornelius. What is he doing here, he spat out. This is Titus. Cornelius said. He had a strange experience this afternoon, and now I must find a place to hide him. What kind of experience? Tabitha asked. Now that he looked at him closely, Amon realized that Titus seemed to be a mummy, a word Amon and his friends used to describe someone whose body was there, but whose mind was not. He was in charge of the crucifixion of Jesus, Cornelius said. Amon and Tabitha looked at each other. If the man upstairs heard this, there would be surely be a riot in the house. And how can we help him? Tamar asked, sounding like she really didn't want to. Cornelius sat his comrade on the table, at the table and then answered, Before the crucifixion, Titus was, an annoying, was annoying and obnoxious as ever, he said. But after Jesus died, he died. He fell to his knees in front of the, his entire squad and started crying. Mom looked at Cornelius in amazement. He kept repeating over and over, surely this is, this man was the son of God. This, his men were ready to turn him over to our commander, Cornelius finished. So I put them to work burying the rest of the criminals and took him home. But now I must find a place to hide him. Amon and Tabitha were silent for a long moment. Then Amon said, did he execute anyone else today? Cornelius was confused for a moment and that understood, understanding crossed his face, and his eyes grew wide. No, Amon, not your father. Tears were streaming down Amon's face, and he fought his desire to kill Titus. No, not at all, Cornelius said quickly. He was on special duty today, for just the one. Suddenly a loud wail erupted from inside the mummy. I killed him, Titus moaned, rocking back and forth. I killed the Son of God. Titus buried his head in his hands and sobbed as Cornelius tried to comfort him. Amon was amazed at the power of a false prophet who could make a Roman soldier behave like this. Of course he may stay here, Tabitha said, and Amon looked at her surprised. Any man who humbles himself before God will be welcome in this house, she added with a look at her son. Thank you, Cornelius said. I must return to my garrison and help in the search for Titus. My commander believes he has just de deserted his post and fled the city. I must help him continue to believe this. Cornelius turned to go, but then stopped and turned back. I am truly sorry about your father, Amon, he said, and about your Messiah. Amon nodded his head, his thanks, and Cornelius slipped out into the night. Tabitha removed Titus' armor as her son stood and watched. Then Amon turned to climb back up the stairs. He passed through the upper room where the disciples and Tamar mourned in silence and went up to the roof where his two brothers lay on their beds, exhausted from their grieving. And as Amon lay down in his own bed, the events of the last two days swam before him, his, before his eyes, just that he could think of nothing else. Hours later, sleep finally began to take over his exhausted mind and tortured body. His last conscious thought was of the prophecies. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew twenty seven fifty one. Is there sin in your life which has separated you from God? 
Is there any hidden, unrepented of selfishness that's keeping you from really knowing him? Jesus' death on the cross was not just a symbolic act. It was a real payment for our real sins. And when that payment was complete, the veil that had stood between us and God for centuries was ripped down the middle. Is there sin in your life? The power of forgiveness is, an ava is as available today as it was the moment Jesus died on the cross. All you have to do is ask. And when you do, the veil that is separating you from God will be torn in two. There are moments in all our lives when we feel lost, unforgiven, and unforgivable, unloved, and abandoned. The disciples felt this way on Saturday night. Everything they believed in and hoped for was gone. To their minds, there would be no grace, no mercy, no future. You know the end of that story, of course, but do you know the end of your own? Will there be a time of spiritual resurrection in your life, or will you choose to live on Saturday with its pain, disappointment, and despair? Throughout the story, you have seen among grow and change. The question is, have you? Okay, so we're at the last chapter is Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Hope you have a blessed time with your family. Good Easter. Love and you. we're going to finish our story this morning. So it wasn't a thought exactly, more like an impression. Kind of a dull throbbing in his brain. Amon rubbed the back of his head to make sure it wasn't just a headache. The throbbing remained, but he still couldn't identify it. Donkey, virgin, Egypt, Bethlehem. The words kept beating in his brain, but Amon didn't know what they meant. Morning sunlight was just covering the city and Amon watched. The warmth of its rays touched his skin but could do, no, do nothing to melt the ice in his heart. He turned from the scene and walked across the roof to the ladder. Yuri and Jaden were sleeping soundly and he left them that way. Better to have sleep with its dreams, he thought, than to wake to the nightmares of this day. All the disciples were still sleeping as well, and Tamar was coiled in her father's arms. Amon's mother was nowhere to be seen, and the Roman Titus snored loudly on one of the table benches. His huge body stretched from one wall to the other. Amon grabbed a pot and decided to fetch his mother some water. There were few people out at the time of morning, and only one at the well. A woman, of course, and as Amon walked down the street toward the square, he watched her raise the bucket and dump, dump it in her urn. But then instead of lifting the urn to her shoulder and carrying her water home, the woman sat down on the bench and began to weep. Amon approached carefully, not knowing what troubled the woman. When he got close enough, he could see that she was not dangerous or mad, only sad. Though it was improper for a man to address a woman directly, Amon couldn't help but feel great compassion for her. Peace to you, he said, and she jumped. May I sit here? Amon had no idea what he could say to a woman to cheer her up, but he was sure Jehovah would not want him to walk away and ignore her. Peace and the blessing of Jehovah. Of course you may sit, she said, and moved to the side. Amon sat and stared straight ahead. Should he ask her what is wrong? It didn't seem the proper thing for a man his age to do. Should he offer her his condolences of whatever tragedy she had suffered? It would be... Two, it would be hard to know the words to say when you don't know the problem. Forgive me, the woman said at last, eliminating Amon's dilemma. The Romans crucified my son two days ago. Amon was quiet for a moment, then said, They crucified my father two days ago, too. The woman looked at Amon. Her forehead creased in concern. My son was innocent, she said, without any hint of, of implying that Amon's father wasn't. So was my father, Amon said anyway. The woman studied Amon's face for several moments and then said, I am truly sorry for your loss. Your grief must be heavier than my own. My son was meant to die. It was the fulfillment of all that was to be. She turned away and finished saying, but that does not make it easier to bear. Who is he talking to? Her mother. Oh. Grandmother. No, her no, son God. died that, two that's, days that, ago. Jesus, that's her, that's um. There, Mary, Jesus. Mary, yeah. Jesus, I, Jesus, Mother Mary. Oh ye! Yeah. It took away a while for the woman's word, words to sink in through Amon's pain, but then it clicked. What do you mean he was meant to die? He asked. 
Mary, the show from up the street, turned both their heads that direction. Mary, he's gone. They took him away, the voice called. It took him on a moment to identify the man running down the street. It was Peter, disciple of Jesus. They took who away, the woman sitting next to him on asked. Jesus, Peter yelled, sliding to a stop, panting and out of breath. The body of Jesus is gone. But I don't under, under, I don't understand either, Peter said, holding out his hand. But come. Mary stood, took Peter's hand, and ran with him up the street, leaving her urn. Amon sat his own pot down and followed close behind. They went through the gate of the Essence and through the camps of pilgrims around the pool of serpents and along the western wall to the other end of the city. They didn't stop until they had reached the garden area where tombs of the wealthy stood. Amon was panting hard as they stopped, but Mary seemed very t barely tired. In the center of the garden stood an open tomb. The large round stone used to seal the entrance had been rolled away. Another disciple, Thomas, was already there, and Peter and Mary went inside. It makes no sense, Thomas said to Amon, when the other two had disappeared inside. Why would someone steal the body of Jesus? Mary and Peter came back out, their faces glowing with joy. He is risen, Mary said, but Amon didn't understand what she was saying. Why would someone steal the body of a dead rabbi? Thomas asked again. And why on the third day? Why not during the first night when the body is fresh? Third day? Those words bounced around in Amon's head. Bethlehem? Virgin? Donkey? Egypt? The dull ache in the back of Amon's head announced itself again. Excuse me, Amon announced, though the others paid him little attention. I must go. Mom wandered back to the city, thinking and entered through the Damascus Gate at the north end. He crossed through the wretched part of town, thinking it didn't look quite so dangerous in the morning, went to the, went to the baths to, at the south end of the temple. He went through the ceremony bathing, as his father had taught him, but somehow it just didn't seem the same. It seemed almost meaningless. When he had dried himself and dressed, Amon went up to the temple, caring not who might see him. He crossed the court of the Gentiles and entered the court of women. From here he could see through the twin brass doors to the temple. Men were climbing all over it, inspecting the damage. Soon the repairs would begin. But what would repair my heart, he wondered. He was standing there watching when from behind he heard a voice of a man. Do you think the temple will ever be the same? Amon recognized the voice and turned to see Rafu, captain of the guard. I think they will repair the building, yes, Amon said, turning back to face the temple. But I do not think they will repair our devotion to it. The veil was torn in two and God was not there. How can we ever treat the temple the same? The veil began tear being torn was simply a result of the earthquake, Rafu said. But it happened in the most particular time. A coincidence, nothing more, Rafu argued, a happenstance of chance happening of chance. Amon turned to the guard again. You play games of chance, he said. What do you think the odds are that the veil separated us from God was ripped at exactly the same moment Jesus died? I do not play, Rufu stopped to his lie and said instead, I would not gamble on those odds in all of my life. Nor would I, Amon said. So what do you think it means? Amon sighed. I think it means a miracle happened here, he said. A miracle of chance. I think there is no God, and that the veil being ripped in two just happened because it happened. Rafu nodded. It would seem so, he said. Otherwise, you would have to believe in this Jesus person as the Messiah, and that clearly cannot be true. But still, Rafu said a moment later, there are a few things that God leaves to chance. He does work in mysterious ways, you know. Amon thought about this and then said, no, I do not believe he does, because I no longer believe there is a God. Rafu was quiet for a mo few moments. After watching the selfishness of the religious leaders, he said at last, I have begun to think that myself. Rafu was silent for another long time and then said, I came over here to see you for a reason. Amon said nothing, so Rafu continued, I saw them march your father away to die. Amon's body started shaking, but still he said nothing. I wanted you to know that he went bravely, with his head held high, he showed the Romans the true courage of a Jewish man. Amon gritted his teeth together and pushed his lips to keep from crying. When finally his throat went under control, he said, I thank you. Stop. Oh. 
You're pushing on me too far. I thank you for telling me that. It is a comfort to know my father was strong. Rafu didn't know what else to say, so he drifted away into the crowd. After a time, Amon also wandered away and back out into the court of the Gentiles. As he passed through the crowds, there was only now beginning to thin after the Passover celebration. It suddenly occurred to Amon that he had left his mother's pot down by the well, had never taken her any water, and in fact had never told her where he was going. He turned and headed for the south Pardico, and when he got there saw Roman soldiers guarding in every entrance. Halt! One of them yelled, one of them yelled pointing somewhere behind Amon. Stop there and hold, on order of the Roman legion. Amon looked around, curious to see who was in trouble, but kept walking. In seconds, six soldiers, taller than trees at sea, and ran toward Amon with their armor clanking. They surrounded him, and the one who had given the order yelled in his face, I told you to hold, he screamed. You would uh, defy the Roman legion? Amon looked at the Roman's face to, from Roman face to Roman face in shock. I, I did not know you spoke to me, he said. What have I done wrong? Silence, the soldier yelled. You will accompany us to Antonia. Pontius Pilate has ordered it. A thunder th a thousand thoughts flashed through Amon's head as two of the soldiers dragged him across the court of Gentiles and down the steps to the fortress, his feet barely touching the ground. If only it had been this easy to get in the other day, he thought. <laughs> his mind ran through a dozen reasons the Romans might want to arrest him, but by the time they reached the judgment court of Pilate, he had narrowed it down to one. Amon and Cornelius had conspired together to hide the centurion Titus. The Romans must have raided Amon's home after he left and were now ready to execute all those involved. As if in, as in confirmation of this, when Amon was dragged into the ju judge's court, Cornelius was already there, standing to the side, waiting to be tried. Amon already knew what the sentence would be. Is this the boy, Pilate said, the one from the house? Cornelius looked at Amon and said, yes, although my Jewish custom, he is considered a man. He looks like a boy to me, Pilate said, and Amon fig figured it wouldn't be a good time to argue the point. Well, will he do it? Pilate asked impatiently. Allow me to inquire, Cornelius said, and by his formal speech, Amon got the idea that Cornelius didn't want Pilate to know they were friends. Boy, Cornelius barked at Amon, your governor has heard stories of your great inventions. Window, window rocks, window rocks that you can see through windmills in the ceiling, and water that runs from the wall on demand. Oh. Your governor would have you build <laughs> such wonders for his palace, Cornelius finished. And the look on his face indicated it would be a good idea for Mon to agree. But Amon was tired, exhausted, and so longer cared about his own fate. Perhaps the governor should have thought of that before he had my father killed, Amon said. A gas swept across the gallery, but no one even heard a man, let alone a Jewish boy, talk to Pilate like this before. What's what's that he's saying? Pilate asked, sitting up straight and confused. I said I have no desire to help the man who had my father crucified, Amon yelled. And now the people in the gallery started heading for the doors, not wanting to be anywhere near Pilate's wrath. Pilate threw up his hands. I'm confused, he said. Will someone please explain what this boy is talking about? Cornelius cleared his throat and then talked softly into Pilate's ear. This is the son of a man Caiaphas sent you to you for execution. He is saying he has lost his desire to work since his father's death sentence. Pilate turned to Cornelius. You mean he's mad at me for giving the order to execute his father? I believe that would be true, Governor, Cornelius said. Pilate thought for several moments. Oh, very well, he said, then said with a wave of his hand turning to Amon, if I give you back the life of your father, then will you create for me these marvelous inventions? Amon wanted to rip Pilate's eyes out. You already killed him, she, he screamed. How will you give him back to me back his life? Totally confused now, covered. Total confusion now covered Pilate's face. He looked at Amon to Caiaphas, then back again. He was about to say something when Cornelius stepped in. Forgive me, governor, but I do not believe the boy is yet aware. Cornelius turned to Amon and stared him in the eyes that his father is still alive. He is being held in the dungeons of Antonio and is scheduled to be executed this afternoon. 
Jason. Amon's eyes grew big, and for several seconds he did not breathe. He stared at Cornelius, wondering if he had heard correctly. Well, Pilot said impatiently, if I gave you back your father's life, will you fill my palace with your inventions? Amon was so dumbstruck that he couldn't speak for several seconds. Finally, he nodded his head and crowed, yes? Yes, of course I will. Who is the man and what is his charge with? Pilate demanded, and Amon realized this was not yet done deal. Ah, uh, he was the man Caiaphas asked you to condemn last week, Cornelius said. Jesus, I thought he already killed him. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. This was the other man, the man charged with stealing from the temple. A thief? I don't want the thieves running around Jerusalem. No, sir, Cornelius said in, in such force that Pilate gave him a sharp look. He was not a thief. This boy here, he said, pointing to Amon, proved his father innocent, and that in fact it was the high priest himself who stole the money. Caiaphas? Stole from his own temple? Pilate leaned his head back and laughed. Now that is something to write Rome about. The governor laughed for several moments, then waved his hand again and said, Very well, if the man is innocent, give him his freedom and tell Caiaphas not to touch him, or I'll audit his treasury myself. As you command. Audit means to count the money and see where it's all going. I know. Um, as you command, Cornelius said, snapped in attention. He handed Pilate a parchment on which to write the order. Then Pilate stood to leave. But you, Pilate said, pointing to Mon, I want your windows filled with this, my windows filled with this, this glass, Governor, Amon said. Yes, this glass, by the end of the week. Pilate started to leave, but turned back again. On second thought, I would like a cool breeze over my bed. Build your wind machine first. Yes, Governor, Amon said with a grin that filled his face. When Pilate had finally left, Cornelius quickly strode over to Amon and took him by the arm. Let us, let us go free your father before Caiaphas hears of this, he said. Amon followed Cornelius down the several stairways to the dungeon. It was much easier getting into in this time, and it would be much easier getting out. Cornelius showed Pilate's order to the guards at the bottom of the stairs, and then the gate was opened. Then they stood and waited for the two of the guards went back into the dungeon. A few moments later, they returned with Jotham, limping between them. Father, Amon yelled, and ran to Jotham. They hugged and cried for several moments, then Cornelius tapped them on the shoulder. It would be best to leave this place quickly, he whispered. There is no order of Pilate's that cannot be changed on a moment's notice. Amon nodded and followed Cornelius back up the stairway, then outside through the front entrance of the fortress. I will leave you here, Cornelius said, but we'll visit soon. Then he went back to Amon and said, Never forget that Jehovah has done for you this day. Amon's face clouded over. I do not know that Jehovah had anything to do with this, he said. So far all I've seen are false prophets and lies. Cornelius dropped to one knee, his bronze armor clanking in protest. He looked a straight in the eye. I have several. Pi I have served Pilate and men like him for more than three decades, he said, and never once have I ever s have I seen what I saw today. A man condemned is a man condemned, and a governor who wants something from a Jew simply gets it, or the Jew dies. The change in Pilate releasing your father. The chances of Pilate releasing. You're distracting me. Please stop that. The chances of Pilate releasing her father for any reason were impossible. Jesus yes, work. Yet it happened. I do not believe it was luck that saved your father. I believe the Spirit of God himself intervened on your behalf. Amon nodded out of respect, was thinking how odd it was to have two conversations on one day about chance and coincidence, and one of them with a Roman. Cornelius crossed his chest with his right arm in salute of the Roman soldiers. They went back to the fortress. My son, Joseph said again, hugging him on. I thought I would never see you again. They embraced for several minutes and started walking home. How is it that I, am f I was freed? Joseph asked. It took him on half the distance to their house to explain. But why are you still alive at all? Amon asked the father. I saw that your cell was empty and everyone thought you had been executed. How did you see that my cell was empty? Joseph asked and was amazed to hear how Amon had tried to rescue him. They did indeed take us from our cells on Friday, Jotham said, finally answering Amon's question. We were being led out to be crucified when suddenly the earthquake hit. Everyone was thrown to the ground and the guards were scared, but when it was over, they went back to the business of killing us. The guards were scared? It was a big earthquake. I'm sorry. Everyone was scared. 
Jotham stopped walking and closed his eyes, remembering the day. We saw Jesus on the cross, it said, and two of our number already hanging next to him. Jotham shook the memories from his head and opened his eyes again. At that moment, he continued, one of the Roman centurions went mad, screaming that he had killed the Son of God. Titus, Ammon exclaimed. It was Titus. I do not know his name, Jotham said, but it, looked, it took all the soldiers to carry, try to control him. He was a very large man. Yes, Ammon said. He takes up half our house and storms like a bull. Jotham looked at his son confused, but then continued the story. Eventually, a centurion escaped, and most, most of the soldiers were sent, excuse me, sent to find him. Two others were ordered to return us to ourselves until the things calmed down. Amon shook his head in wonder. If Titus hadn't been struck with remorse at just that moment, he said to himself. What was that? his father asked. Nothing, Amon said. Just another coincidence. By now, Amon and Jotham had reached the house, and... Uh, Amon pushed open the door and saw his mother and brothers trying to force themselves to eat a new meal. Tabitha looked up first, saw Amon, and was just about to ask who the visitor was when she recognized him. She screamed and jumped up, knocking over the table. Her two younger sons, covering in soup, began to protest when they saw Jotham. Yuri ran to his father instantly, but Jaden sat and stared, as if afraid that it, what he saw was not true. Then Jotham called to his second son, and Jaden flew to his arms. The entire family fell on Jotham, hugging and crying and asking, How can this be? Eventually, Jotham and Amon got the whole story out, and Tabitha couldn't believe Amon would be working for Pontius Pilate. When finally the family started accepting that Jotham was really alive, Tabitha took him aside. Bartholomew is in the upper room, he said. He needs to know you are alive. Needs to know. Jotham nodded and climbed the stairs, then Amon right behind him. Eight of the disciples were now sitting around the table making plans. Blankets had been hung over the windows and the disciples spoke in hushed tones. The bowls of rice and plates of, of broiled fish Tabitha prepared for the men sat untouched on the table. As Amon listened, he could tell the disciples were scared and trying to decide what to do. We must leave Jerusalem as soon as dark, one of them said, and each of us go. Go where? Another asked. Go home? We cannot go home. We cannot go anywhere. Caiaphas will find us no matter where we go. What do you think, James? A third one asked. It was then that Bartholomew turned and saw his friend standing behind him. He jumped up and spun around, staring Jotham in the face. It's a ghost, I see, he said, or a demon in the skin of my friends. It is neither, Jotham said. It is I in the flesh, still alive, and a free man. Jotham and Bartholomew embraced for a short explanation was given. Then Jotham asked why the disciples were meeting so secretly. Caiaphas has many eyes and sharp ears, Bartholomew said. Now that Jesus is dead, he will be rooting out all of his followers and finding reasons to arrest them. Hmm, Jotham said, stroking his chin. Do you believe Jesus would want you to hide his, mes hide his message behind closed doors and covered windows? Jesus is dead, the disciple named Andrew said, pounding the table with his fist. I no longer know if, I, if he was the Messiah or not. But I do know he is nothing now. He is, his message was Andrew's search for words. His message was fanciful. Sweet words in a sour society. They are not practical. Love is always practical, Jotham said. And Andrew was or Amon was amazed that his father could speak clearly to a group of such knowledgeable people. And it is those words which I will someday sweeten this sour society and all that come after it that will someday. How do you know, the disciple named James spat out. Did you follow Jesus for the last four years as we did? No, Joseph admitted. But I was there for his birth, as was Bartholomew here, and my wife Tabitha. And I watched him grow and listened to him speak on many occasions. I was there when he fed 5,000 people with some loaves of bread and a few fish. I talked to people when he was healed and listened to people whose lives were changed. And in all of this I know, Jotham concluded, that Jesus did only did not only that Jesus not only spoke of love, he lived it as well. It was an eternal love which could only come from the Messiah. A hush argument continued at some time until a pounding on the door below stopped the mid sentence. They listened as Tabitha greeted someone. Moments later John and the other James came up from below. Mom thought they looked as happy as if they'd just come from a wedding. He's alive, they shouted, not caring about covering windows or closed doors. We saw him. 
This created a bedlam, and the other disciples were excited and doubtful at the same time. The two decided how, how they had been walking, described how they had been walking to Emmaus when Jesus came up and started walking with them. It could not have been him, Andrew said. You must have been mistaken. The argument continued, and Jotham leaned over to whisper to Amon's ear, Let us leave them into their discussion, he said. This is a matter for chosen ones of Jesus. They slipped away from the group around the table at the end of the room and went to the stairway at the, door, at the other. Just, but just as they reached it, the room was suddenly filled with a moment of bright light and the air smelled as sweet as strawberries and as fresh as they were standing atop a mountain. Standing in the middle of the room where no one had been a moment before was Jesus and Nazareth. <laughs> Everyone in the room stared at Jesus, their mouths hanging open. Two of them fell back from the table and hid in the corner, terrified. Someone screamed, it's a ghost! But most of them just shook it into, shocked into silence. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Jesus said. A mom thought his voice had the strength of a lion and the gentleness of a lamb all at once. Why are you troubled? And why do you doubt rise? Why does doubt rise in your minds, he said. Then he held out his hands and said, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Amon saw the wounds. It could not believe they could be made by anything but rusty spikes. Still, he had not seen Jesus on the cross. It could not accept that dead man was now alive. When Jesus turned, he gazed from his disciples and looked Amon in the eyes. And that's when Amon knew. Those eyes, those piercing, loving, knowing, and compassionate eyes. This was indeed Jesus, Amon decided. And before he knew it, Amon rushed to Jesus, fell to his knees, threw his arms around the Messiah's legs, and cried out, My Lord and my God. Jesus touched Amon's head, then pulled the young man's face up towards his own and smiled, turned to his disciples and says, Do you have anything here to eat? Amon sat at the table with them as Jesus ate some of the broiled fish Tabitha had prepared. Jesus explained many things then, then, saying, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Finally, Amon realized that the words going around in his head all day had meant they were the prophecies. The evidence that would prove the identity of the Messiah when he came. Prophecies of his birth in a town called Bethlehem. Of his fleeing to Egypt. Their arriving in Jerusalem on a colt. Prophecies which could not be made up. Then suddenly as the man was talking to each other, Jesus was gone. For a time, another argument started to, as to whether Jesus, who was really there, had been there or not. But Amon knew. Amon had touched him. And finally, Amon believed. Many days passed with Jesus appearing to hundreds of people, making believers of most and disciples of many. Then one day Ammon, Tamar, and Jotham, following Bartholomew and the rest of the disciples up to the Mount of Olives, Tabitha walked with them as well, with Uri and Jaden under her arms. Do you, did you talk to Saul again? Jotham asked Ammon as they talk, walked. Yes, Ammon answered. He is so stubborn. I do not think he would believe even if Jesus stood right in front of him and, and struck him blind. He Jotham was. laughed and gave his son a hug. It was after several moments of silence as they continued to walk and Amon asked this question, Father, you really did see an angel when you were young, didn't you? All the stories you've ever told me, they were all true. Jotham smiled and nodded. Yes, my son, all those things were true. The angels I saw, the things I heard, the journey I took, the birth of Jesus, these were all true. Amon hung his head and looked away. I have been such a fool, he said. I have had the most special of fathers and thought him to be mad. Jotham pulled his son close. As he stroked Amon's hair, he said, No, my son, you have not been a fool. You have been young, and now you have shown your maturity by allowing your mind to learn new things. Joseph looked, stopped, took Amon's tear-stained face in his hands, and turned it up so he could look into the boy's eyes. And more than anything else you have done, that is a true sign of becoming a man. 
Amang hugged his father tightly and they continued walking. Soon they arrived at the top, top of Mount of Olives, just on the other side of the Kindron Valley from Jerusalem. Jesus was with them and he stood now in front of the group of believers. All authority in heaven is and on earth has been given to me, he said, in such a loud voice that it echoed up the hills like thunder. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus' robes began to glow a bright white. Suddenly he began to ascend into the air, and everyone gasped. Ascend into heaven. And lo, I will be with you always, Jesus said as he rose, even to the very end of the age. Amon fell to his knees as, if, as did everyone else. He raised his hands toward heaven in complete submission and watched as Jesus ascended higher and higher into the air. Now everything makes sense, Amon thought. Now the world is truly in order. And then Jesus was gone. Gone from sight, Amon thought, but not gone from my heart. He will never be gone from my heart. I will follow him always and do whatever he asks of me. And that, as it turned out, was just the beginning of Amon's adventures. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John three sixteen. When it comes to God of love seeking you out, calling you into relationship with him, making every effort to give you, get you to listen to him, there is no such thing as a coincidence. He had a plan from the beginning and it will continue calling to you all the days of your life. If you choose to follow him, the blessings you receive, even in tough times, will be no coincidence either. I pray with all of my heart that you will make that choice. And discover, as I have, the abundance of joy waiting for you. May the God of love and peace, the God of forgiveness and mercy, the God of all hope and power, reign in your heart now and for years to come and forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. I hope you like the book. If uh, you want to read it, all the, there is links into the description where you can find it and uh, the author's other books for Advent. Um, maybe we can do a Christmas Advent reading or something. Yeah. At Christmas! And don't forget to like, subscribe, and see you all next time. Bye! Bye.